Hello everyone and welcome to this week's episode of The Aftermath. Before I get into it, I would just like to apologize because I know this video is coming out a bit late. Um, I wasn't feeling the best last night so I kind of just chilled and took notes and then made the video this morning. So I apologize for the video coming out a little bit late. But I am here now so let us not waste any time at all and let's dive right into this week's episode of Critical Role. So first off, we had the curious new NPC, the Cajun accent stuttering tortle bard. He was a rather interesting fellow, and one one thing that I noticed in this conversation, he sort of displayed his uh, his bardic abilities with his bagpipes, and you know he was a little bit down on himself in the sense that he knows that a lot of people don't appreciate or don't like his music since it was kind of bad. And also considering the fact he is a turtle and I guess they're quite rare in these parts. I mean, we haven't seen another turtle at all. So we know that they are rare. They may be, they may be frightening to some people, which is also why he hasn't had a job recently or hasn't you know been on a, on a crew. For those reasons, his maybe may lack of uh, musical ability and his appearance. And it was very apparent that he was down on himself in these facts. Uh, however, Jester immediately uh, tried to lift him back up again. You know, when he was saying how, you know, my appearance, you know, is, is kind of off putting to some people, Jester was like, it, it's the bagpipes saying that maybe it's the bagpipes that are what's holding you back not not your appearance not not your talent it's it's possibly a fault in the instrument so it's just it just reinforces jester's how, how jester likes to support people you know she do, she never tries to tear people down she always tries to see the best in people and it's a really beautiful quality that i definitely appreciate uh, jester having and she does this with her fellow party members all the time. So it's nice that even to a complete stranger, she is trying to, you know, make them smile. She's trying to she's trying to be the light in the world that it desperately needs. So then now on to the topic of Marius. I believe that's what his name is. He's, I guess, sort of the main person they're trying to find at this point, besides Algar, the the one that is bothering the ruby. Marius was mentioned in that letter that they found from the Iron Shepherds. So that's that's the main reason they came down here in the first place. But now, who is this man? Who is Marius? And why is he so important? Now, from the information we've been given, it seems like Marius is more of a middleman. He doesn't seem like to be he doesn't seem to be a top dog by any means. Because of everyone they've they've talked to and asking about Marius, they they've They've been they've been relatively straightforward. They're a bit, you know, hesitant at first since you know, strange people coming and asking you questions about someone. You're gonna be a little bit hesitant, but I mean they got the information out, no problem. So it's obvious that Marius isn't an extremely important player in this whole letter situation. Otherwise, it would be mum's the word. No one would be talking about Marius. They may not even know who he is. So it's obvious that Marius gets around. He seems to be more of like a delivery man or just like a, a mercenary for hire, something like that. And it was mentioned by, I believe, the turtle that Marius was waiting on something to be delivered. Now, obviously that can mean anything. However, let's use what we already know in this universe and things that the party has done and gone through to try to figure out what this delivery could be. Now, if you all remember, they came across a sack of gems, I believe it was, in a field behind some, in some rocks or something on their way down to the Menagerie Coast. And it looked as though it was left there for someone. And then as they took the stuff, started going back down the road, they saw a courier of some sort. And they had that sort of pass where Matt sort of went in slow motion and you, you saw like this man wearing like a mask or something. And then they, they just kept on going. Obviously that means something or else why would Matt even do that? Now, this is the first time where a delivery was brought up and someone waiting for one. And since Matt usually doesn't do things for no reason, there's usually always a connection somewhere. I think it's possible that the courier was going to pick up the gems and bring them back down to the Menagerie Coast. It's not likely, but given information we already know, we might as well use what we have. 
Obviously, it could come out that it's not related whatsoever and it's connected to something completely different. But it's possible. It's possible that Marius is waiting for this and obviously it's never going to come. But we'll have to see what he actually is waiting for. Now, what is the connection uh, of the Menagerie Coast to the Iron Shepherds from this letter that they found in the Iron Shepherds? Why were the Iron Shepherds, who are basically on the opposite side of the continent, why are they corresponding with someone or something or a group down in the Menagerie Coast? What is there to gain? What is there going on down here? Now, it's possible as the episode went on, they were able to get down into the, the underbelly of the city into like the sewer area where they found Algar and an interesting foe. The name is, is like Jundi, Jundi, something like that. It's like a water creature serpent thing. It looked as though there was sort of a connection between Algar and this serpent creature, Jundi. Now, obviously the first thing that comes to mind is this creature is enslaved by Algar. So that could be one connection. There's some sort of like a, like a magical creature slavery going down in the, the, the criminal network of the Menagerie Coast. And that's why the Iron Shepherds were sort of corresponding with them. They were maybe trying to smuggle some magical creatures or do some trading. That's one possibility, and that's the only one that I think we've seen so far that could be a potential possibility as a connection. Of course, I'm sure more will come to light as the party, hopefully next week, goes to the docks at midnight and tries to find Marius, and maybe they can get some more answers that way, but we'll have to see. And now back in the beginning, when they're still in the tavern, Ford talked to a captain, Captain Andela, I think it was, Andula? Uh, the name is escaping me. But it seems as though Ford is interested in possibly joining a crew again, since she did offer the opportunity to be a part of her crew, and it seems as though her crew will be going to Marquette, now, I don't think the Mighty Nine have any business to go there. However, we'll see how this arc sort of unfolds, this sort of Nicodranus arc. We'll see how it unfolds. Maybe there'll be clues that lead them to Marquette, or maybe down the line they will have to go there for whatever reason. But now they have a way to get there. Possibly, as long as Andula comes back every now and then, since I believe she will be leaving soon. I'm not sure, I'll have to go back and rewatch the episode to confirm. But Ford rejoining a crew and going sailing again is on the table. He will consider it at some point, maybe. I, I'm i thinking that once one of these arcs or an arc finishes, they may have a, an extended period of downtime. You know, back in campaign one, they had the whole year where they had, you know, they could do whatever they wanted. It's possible that we maybe get, that we might get something like that in the second campaign. It'll probably be this early on. It may just be a couple months, and it's possible in those couple months Ford may decide to go on his own and join a crew and go sailing for a little while. It is possible, but we will have to see if we get that opportunity. And what do you know? Yasha is back this episode. Unfortunately, I don't think she's going to be back next week, but it was nice to see her again. As always, I was not expecting it, so it was very nice to have her back on the show. And Caleb kept bringing up an interesting point how, you know, it's... It's, it's crazy how she keeps showing up. It's almost like it's fate. And it seems that with Caleb's studies of the dodecahedron and how he's starting to understand what's what it's all about, and he's making the connection of these, these rays of light that sort of arc out and go in different directions are destinies sort of intertwining and going off in different directions. It's possible that he's starting to understand and maybe start to figure out that the Mighty Nine's destinies are intertwined and the fact that Yasha keeps coming back just reinforces this theory that he's coming up that their destinies are intertwined and connected in some way. So obviously bigger things are going to be coming but now it's up to Caleb to sort of figure out what are those big things? You know, why are we connected? What is the purpose? You know, I didn't know these people a couple months ago. Now that we've met, all this craziness has happened. What's the, what's the purpose? What's the meaning? Why us? Why are we connected? So these are sort of the questions that are, going to be going, that are going to be going through Caleb's head as we move forward. And then my favorite part of the episode, as I'm sure many of you others share the same opinion, Beauregard's Valley Girl. Yes, I thought that was absolutely wonderful and hilarious and awkward for Beau since we've never seen her like that. So it was just super hilarious to see that side of her. 
but it is also very interesting. Now, obviously, Marisha is an actress, so she knows how to take up different roles. However, Bo is not, most likely. So, narratively, while Beauregard did play the Valley Girl act very well, we have to try to understand now why. You know, we've never seen her act this way, so where is this coming from? It's possible that when she was growing up, this was how she was taught to act, you know, when she was being raised by her father and mother before her mother left the picture, since we haven't really heard of her, so I'm assuming the mother is no longer either alive or with the family. So it's possible that the father and mother sort of raised her to be this sort of preppy girl, you know, she may have gone to like private schools, her family was rich, not really sure. So it's possible she sort of tapped into her younger self to sort of fulfill this role. Or as Ford was saying how, you know, oh, do you, do you know someone like this? When she was sort of describing how she was gonna act. It's possible that she did have a friend or an acquaintance or an enemy that acted this way. However, I'm more leaning towards the theory that this was how she was raised to be and so she sort of, she grew up to rebel against that and become the complete opposite. But it is intriguing and interesting that she acted this way so naturally and it obviously pained her to do so. So while it was a funny, lighthearted moment, I think there's a little bit more to it than just what's on the surface. And now fast forwarding a little bit down to when they are in the sewers, Caleb was able to get Nott down there through the suggestion spell. Now I wonder how Nott will feel about that or if she really cares. Uh, she's obviously seen Caleb use magic on other people and typically I believe she's seen it used in a malicious manner. Albeit sometimes it's used to better the group or to move things along. Now obviously Nott can probably come to the conclusion that Caleb has the best intentions in mind when he used the spell on her, but I'm like 99% sure that she'll be okay with it and Caleb's just looking out for her and trying to get her to get over her fears of the water. And speaking of water, they had to fight water. And it's kind of poetic in a way since not sort of literally had to fight her fears. So maybe after all of this is over, maybe she'll be over it. Maybe she'll be over her fears since she was able to defeat it. And then another nice moment as they, I believe it was after they destroyed the two in that bigger chamber, they were sort of moving along. And I think Jester and Nott were talking about the kind of poetic irony of destroying the water and such and sort of facing her fears. I, that may have been what the conversation was, I may be misremembering, but they were talking about something and it made Caleb laugh. Liam sort of in character said, Caleb laughs at this or Caleb is laughing, which I thought was interesting because I don't think now we've had many episodes of Critical Role so far this campaign and it's very likely that I have forgetting moments, but I th think this may be the first time where Liam has said Caleb is laughing in a like joyous manner. There have been other times that Caleb has laughed where it, but it's more like awkward and like tense. It's not really happy laughter. So I thought that was a very nice small moment that maybe other people missed and I could just be reading too far into it and I could be forgetting other times that he's had moments where he's laughed in a happy manner. However, if my memory serves me correctly, this is the first time. So it's a nice it's a nice step in the right direction for Caleb. He's starting to see the joy in things again. He's starting to be happy again. Maybe he's taking steps towards finally, you know, being okay with himself. Now, obviously, I think he still has a long way to go, but it is a step in the nice in the in the right direction. And now in the fight with Jundi and that other water elemental and Algar and his bodyguards. We know that Ford has a lot to do with water, you know, his sword uh, comes from the ocean, his, his patron is some kind of tentacle octopus big eye thing, so it's no surprise that he has a lot of aquatic traits. However, what is interesting is his a few of his spells are thunder related, like Booming Blade and that awesome teleport one where it like shatters the air and causes thunder damage and AoE, that was super cool. But the question is why? Why thunder? And the simple and obvious answer is that in his sailing days, you know, his his last crew that he was aboard during that terrible explosion, it's possible that a storm had accompanied it. Now I know there was sabotage, 
and I can't remember exactly what the story was. There could have been a storm going on. However, it wasn't sort of put into the, the spotlight as the main reason why the ship was destroyed. Now, it could be. I, again, could be misremembering, but this, the storms that you encounter when you're sailing is the reason why Ford has these sort of thunder-based spells. And now our grave cleric, Caduceus. He had a slight brush with death, I, s I guess you could say, a few times this episode. So given the fact that he's a grave clerk and he's very comfortable with the idea of death, it'll be interesting to see if he has anything to say about his, his near-death experience that he just had. Obviously, we don't know if he's had them before, but if this is his first time, he, uh, we'll have to see how he feels about it. He, it could just be like, oh, you know, death is just the next step in a long journey, but it'll be interesting to see if he has anything to say about it. And also in the fight, Caleb went down, I believe, but thanks to Molly's, <laughs> Molly's necklace, he was able to stabilize. And it's just kind of heartwarming to see not sort of laser focuses on Caleb when, whenever he's in danger and immediately rushes to his, uh, to his aid. This isn't the first time it's happened. You know, she completely disregards the fact that, you know, Jester is a healer and she doesn't even trust her to, to heal him, even though we all know that Jester would. But it's just kind of nice to see that, you know, Caleb and Nat's relationship is so strong. Nat is willing to just disregard all the dangers around her and just rush to Caleb and make sure he's safe and okay and still alive. And considering this is a rather dangerous fight and Clay and Caleb almost died, I think it's time the party started to consider the pets and maybe not bring them along when they're going down into sewers because if they do there is a very high chance that they will die and I don't want that I know hopefully all of you do not want that so I think they need to make sure the pets are safe secure on the carts in some kind of an inn and they need to not take them on the adventures until maybe the blink dog is a bit older and maybe can fight but we'll have to see but they definitely need to take better care of their pets. And going back to Ford, he used a rather interesting ability. He was able to summon a sort of specter ghost from one of the fallen bodyguards. Now, I can't remember if this is the first time it's happened. For some reason, I feel like it's not. I feel like he's used it before. But again, I could be completely wrong. But it is an interesting ability. And if Caleb sort of learns that Ford is able to do this, it's possible that Caleb will want to use it. Maybe if his parents were buried or if they were completely burned to ash in the fire if they're buried it's possible that he'll want to go to the maybe their grave site and maybe try to ask ask for to try to raise them it's not very likely but caleb might find interest in a spell like that and now the last thing i want to talk about is again the moral compass of our group you know, they do great things in all fields, then they do some crime for the gentleman, they steal some random person's sack of gems, they take up a job to help Jester's mother. Where where does this thing point? Because, you know, obviously Algar is a creepy dude, stalking her mother, being a jackass, and obviously there is something shady going down in the sewers, but we don't we don't really know. We don't know a lot of information. And the Mighty Nine just ran in there and just decided to kill him, you know, without even asking any questions. Now, obviously he's not dead, but they had no issue severely maiming him and Ford sort of torturing him by cutting off his hand. And Ford was the person that seemed to be the more like, maybe not lawful good, but more of a good alignment. And he just goes off and cuts off this, this guy's hand that he doesn't even know. So it's very strange that the Mighty Nine is doing all of these things and not even thinking about the consequences or just not even thinking about, it's not even stopping and being like, what are we doing? They did out of character, you know, they're like, why are we, why are we almost killing this guy? But in character, they, they, they seem to have no issue totally obliterating these guys without even thinking of the consequences or asking questions or really even knowing the full story of what's even going on. What this does mean is that the Mighty Nine are, well, reckless for one. It's perhaps they will need to, you know, sort of sort through that and try to figure out a more solid game plan when they're approaching situations like this because going about things and not thinking about the consequences is a very good way to get yourself killed or in a terrible situation that could have been avoided but this also means that perhaps they'll take jobs however they you know as they come they'll take whatever job 
that comes their way considering they have no issue doing crime they have no issue being the heroes so as of right now it seems like this story could go either way i don't think that this campaign will go into like an evil side however it'll definitely have a lot more darker elements possibly instigated by the group given the sort of tasks and jobs they've taken but we'll have to see we'll have to see where their sort of moral compass ends up as they progress and sort of grow as characters but that's gonna about do it for this episode i hope you all enjoyed it as much as i did i am very interested to see what comes of this sort of mystery involving the letter and what algar is hiding and who this marius fellow is and hopefully we'll see our cajun bard portal once again. But with that, I hope you all have a fantastic rest of your weekend, and I will see you all next week.